Hello everybody, and welcome to a Maker's Pilgrimage. I'm Aiden, the Knitting Monk, coming to you from Holy Cross Monastery in New York's Hudson Valley. I want to thank you for taking time to watch this podcast. Thank you to all of you who are returning from previous episodes, and to anybody who's watching for the first time. If you like what you see, I would encourage you to hit the subscribe button and hit the thumbs up. I love getting comments on the videos and uh, responding to them, starting a conversation with those of you uh, who are watching, because that's the whole purpose of my doing this project to begin with. Um, also, I want to let you know that you can find me on social media, on Instagram, and on Ravelry with the username Knitting Monk. All the show notes for this episode will be uploaded on my blog, which is theknittingmonk.wordpress.com, and all those links will be down below in the YouTube notes as well. So really, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for showing up for this today. Today's episode is probably going to be a little bit longer than uh, the previous ones. We're probably going to go for 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, um, because I have a lot to share with you. Um, so the way I'm going to structure it today is uh, go through some finished objects and some works in progress, um, both with my knitting and my sewing. And um, then I'm going to talk about um, uh, some cabling. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions from people about cables. And as you know, if you follow me on Instagram or Ravelry, or if you've watched previous episodes of this podcast, I am a cable fanatic. So um, I'm going to talk about cabling and, and my philosophy of cabling, why I do it, why I love it, and then some tips and tricks as well for successful cabling. Um, and then I also want to answer a few questions that I've received. Um, so there will be a little chit chat kind of section as well. So um, stay tuned um, for, for all of that. Um, the first thing I want to talk about actually is that um, we just had a harvest of honey. It, uh, the day after I recorded the last episode, actually, um, we harvested from uh, two of our four beehives here at the monastery, and we got 50 pounds of honey, um, which is, um, if you can see here, which is 60 of these little 12-ounce honey bears. Now, we got the same amount last year as well, uh, and what we did with it was we chose to sell the honey in our shop here at the monastery. Um, this year, we made a different choice. We've decided to hold on to the honey. We're not going to sell it, and we're going to use it here at the monastery. Um, now, just to give you a little bit of context, um, we run a large guest house, and we also have 20 brothers in our community. So we actually go through probably about 300 of these every single year, maybe more. Um, and so our small production, you know, actually 50 pounds is a lot of honey, but our small production um, won't even meet a third of our usage. Um, so we're going to keep it and use it for special things, cooking in the guest house, gifts to some people. Um, we'll use it, you know, for teas and things like that. Um, but that was really exciting. It's very cool to keep bees, I have to say. It's like I, I had the chance a couple of uh, year ago, I think, maybe two years ago now, to catch a swarm of bees. Our hive had swarmed, which meant that half of the, um, half of the colony left to go form a new colony. Um, and they're very docile at that point. And so I caught, uh, with one of our other beekeepers, a swarm of bees and I was holding it in this plastic box right up against my chest and it was just humming, vibrating. You know, there's just such life there. It's really incredible. So 
I don't get to do a lot of work with the bees anymore because I'm really busy doing other things, but, um, but I did get to help out with the honey harvest and that was a lot of fun. Um, so that in a sense is my first finished object, 60 of these little honey bears um, that I um, got to help harvest with, with some of the other members of our community. The, um, the rest of my finished objects are, um, well, my other finished object, because there's only one, um, is, is fiber related. Um, I took a break after I had finished the back side of my Heston pullover that I was talking about last time. Um, I took a break and made a cabled beanie for my mom. Um, it is the Hutchin hat, which is designed by Jared Flood for Brooklyn Tweed, who I love, as you know. Um, and it's a fingering weight cabled beanie. Um, and for this, I used Knit Picks uh, Hawthorne sock yarn, um, the tonals in the colorway um, Serpent, I think it was called. Um, so I'll insert a picture of that here because I've already sent off the hat. So that hat um, uh, was for my mom. Like I said, she's, um, she has breast cancer and she's going through chemo and she'd started to lose her hair already. So she had shaved off her head, which means that she and I look like twins at this point. Um, but she said her head is always cold and the only hat she has is a hat that I knit for her for Christmas last year also cabled um, and from Brooklyn Tweed. Um, so she had asked me if I would make her another hat. And um, I said that at some point this fall, I would make her another hat. Well, I thought, you know, I'm gonna be away for uh, most of October. I have this intense cable project I'm working on now before my trip. So I figured I better go ahead and make that hat for her now so that it's done and she can wear it as the days get colder. Um, so I, I stopped and I made the hat. Um, now I've used this pattern before. It makes a beautiful hat. I really, I think the hat turned out great. Um, and it used up a skein of yarn that I've had in my stash for over two years now. So that is great. The downside, um, or what I didn't love, it's not a downside, but what I didn't love about the project was that I normally knit hats out of worsted weight yarn, sometimes DK weight, and fingering weight hats just take forever. And by forever, I mean it took about five days to make the hat. But for a hat project, that is a long time for me. I mean, I'm used to like two, three days, hat is done. Um, and I think of them as really fast projects, but this was not a really fast project. It seemed to take a long time time. Um, so I do recommend it. It's a great pattern. It's a beautiful hat. That was all me. That was my expectations were just not, you know, I wasn't thinking, oh, it's a fingering weight hat. It's going to take longer. I need to be patient. Um, I just wanted it to be done. Um, but it did turn out great. It'll keep her head warm. And uh, I put it in the mail to her yesterday with a whole care package full of stuff. Um, just to cheer her up. She's, she's finishing the first section of chemo um, and she's switching to a different drug that they use for chemo at her next treatment and, and so its side effects will be different and that kind of thing. So just as a marker and a way to cheer her a little bit, send her that, that care package. Um, the other finished object, I said only had one, but I don't know if you can hear the plane in the background. I'll wait till it goes by. Um, the other object that I had actually was I did sew two more tote bags. Um, both of them, if you saw last episode, with the um, the dark denim uh, outside and the Day of the Dead lining on the inside. Excuse me. So I, I sent her one of those tote bags as well. And I didn't take any pictures of them, so um, 
So unfortunately, you'll have to look back at last episode if you want to want to see a photo of it. Um, but I wasn't trying to imply anything for her with the Day of the Dead. She just likes stuff like that. So, so that's why I sent it. Um, by way of transition, actually, from finished object into works in progress, um, I do have what when I knit a big sweater project, I sort of think of the component parts as finished projects, um, finished object, and that helps me stay motivated to keep going. So I can say like, oh yes, I finished the back. Um, and then I feel excited to keep going with the project. Um, so I did finish the back of my Heston pullover and it is has just come off the blocking board yesterday. So, voila, sorry for the light. That's, oh, that's a much better, much better image of the color um, on it. Um, so, and then you can see at the bottom there, it has those, um, the cabled ribbing at the bottom. It just, it turned out so beautiful. I love, love, love this pattern. It is so gorgeous. Um, as if, if you listened in last time, you'll, you'll know that I'm a little frustrated. I still am a little frustrated, actually, with the, the pattern writing. Um, but the cable design is really exquisite. So um, I'm really, um, really excited about this. Um, and I just, I want to get it finished. I'm, I'm trying to finish this pullover for a trip I'm taking to the UK. Um, in October, and I'll tell you more about that in the chit chat section. Um, but as a part of that trip, I'm going to be visiting Ireland for the first time. And I don't know, I just have all these romantic images of, you know, sea washed cliffs standing there in my Aaron pullover or whatever. So um, I just want to get it finished for that trip. Um, and, um, and I'm leaving in three weeks. So um, this is, to keep going with the, the work in progress, I started on the front side, um, and this is how much I have of the front. Um, so you can see I have a long way to go on the front. Three weeks doesn't seem to me like a lot of time to knit 25 inches of the front, um, plus two sleeves, plus time to block the pieces plus time to seam them together and knit a collar. So I'm going to do the best that I can and I'm going to see how much I get done. I have a tentative goal to finish this front piece by next Sunday. Today is Sunday when I'm recording, uh, which is why I'm in my habit, by the way. I wear my habit on Sundays, um, generally speaking. Um, but um, I'm hoping by next Sunday to be done with the front so it can get on the blocking board and then I can start on the sleeves. If the sleeves take about hmm, five days a piece, um, you know, I can block one sleeve. Uh, I can be blocking the second sleeve and already be seaming the piece together, you know. So that's my goal. Hopefully that will happen. Um, so that's the Heston pullover. I forgot to say it's knit in um, Briggs and Little Regal um, in the colorway Midnight Blue, which is, as you could see, this really beautiful, very dark kind of black navy, um, which I ordinarily would not use that color for cables, but these are very sculptural and, and kind of bold cables, so they really stand out in that dark color. Um, what else do I have on my list here that I wanted to tell you about? Oh, yes. Um, I have, just one second here. I'm learning when you're talking for 45 minutes straight, you know, you need some liquid refreshment. So I'm drinking tea out of my New York Botanic Garden mug here. Mm. Um. The other work in progress that I have going on right now actually is a sewing project. Um, I think I had mentioned last time that I was going to buy the pattern, or maybe I'd already bought it, for the Merchant and Mills. Uh, it's called The Tea, 
It's a men's pattern, um, a woven fabric t-shirt. Um, and they marked it as a beginner's pattern, but I just loved the look of it. So beautiful and simple um, and elegant. And actually I have the pattern right here. This is the pattern. And you can see on the back, that's kind of what it's meant to look like uh, right there. And so this is the very first garment I've ever sewn. Um, the very first time I'd ever done a curved seam, anything like that. Um, and if you watched last time, you'll remember that I said I was gonna get some very inexpensive fabric and kind of do almost like a muslin uh, kind of thing uh, before I started with a nice fabric. Well, you see, what had happened was I went to Joanne's with one of my brothers looking for an inexpensive fabric. And we were in the $5 cottons. So everything I was looking at was $5 a yard. And I didn't really find anything that I liked because I did want to be able to wear this garment. Um, and finally I found a bolt of fabric and it was this beautiful soft gray, kind of a medium gray colored cotton, <clears throat> very soft. And I said, oh, perfect, this is what I'll use. Well, then I look at the label, and of course, it's three times as expensive as everything else in that section. Um, and I just, my brother and I laughed because, you know, you could blindfold me and put me in a shop, and I would find the most expensive thing in there. Um, even without being able to see them. So I decided I did have a great coupon because I hate paying retail, so I had a great coupon. And um, I thought, well, okay, fine. I'll buy this cotton, it'll be fine. Um, then I found a really, really gorgeous uh, kind of plum colored linen. It's actually a linen rayon blend. Um, and I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, that is gorgeous. I really want that fabric. Um, and I looked at the price and it was less than the cotton. And I said, oh, well, if it's less than the cotton, I'm saving money. I have to get this one instead. Um, so that is what I did. And I have started sewing this project. You'll see, this is, let's see, give you a close up. That's kind of the color right there. Um, you'll see I've gotten the shoulder seams done. And this is the part that just wowed me. I sewed this uh, pocket right there. Sewed the pocket. Um, it's the first curved seam I've ever done. Um, it's not perfect at all. If you look up close, you'll see all kinds of mistakes on it. Um, but I just had this feeling when I had finished with it of, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I have done this myself. Um, and it's funny that a pocket can do that for you, but it can. So anyway, I'm really, really in love with this pattern. It's a beautiful pattern very easy to work with so far um, and then this fabric is just unbelievably beautiful um, so i'm really really excited i'm going to hopefully get this finished in the next couple of days um, something i've learned with sewing is that it goes in for me at least it goes in spurts um, whereas knitting you know you just do in a row at the time and then eventually you have a finished object. With sewing, I just ignore it for days on end, and then I'll spend an hour and I'll get, you know, 50% of the project done. You can't spend an hour and get 50% of a knitting project done. That would be um, unbelievable. So, um, so that's my other work in progress um, that I am really excited about. Um, I do, of course, I've gotten so like enthusiastic about sewing now that um, I have a whole list of things I want to sew. 
Um, and I know that some of you are also sewists and uh, have sewn some of these things, so I'm just going to tell you about them real quickly. Um, a good uh, a friend of mine gave me a box full of Marimekko fabric, these beautiful prints. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, these are like big quantities of fabric. Each one is three yards or so, and then some smaller pieces. And, you know, they're not things, they're not patterns that I would wear. Um, so I was thinking, what would I do with them? I mean, they're really beautiful. I would love to sew with them. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I could make my mom and some female friends of mine dresses from them. Um, they would really love getting them. They'd be wonderful presents. And I would really, you know, I'd get to practice a lot of sewing skills that way. Um, that I could apply also to my own, um, to my own clothing. And I'm also a big believer in using what I have before I buy more. So because I have this cache of fabric, I want to use it before I buy another bunch of fabric for my own clothes. Um, so I bought two dress patterns um, from Tilly and the Buttons. I bought the Bettine dress and I bought the Francoise dress. So I'm going to start with the Bettine dress and I'm going to make a, a dress for my mom for Christmas. Um, and it's supposed to be a beginner pattern. I read through the pattern and it looks really, really straightforward. Um, and yet I haven't done most of those techniques, so I'll get the chance to learn and to practice from them and to use some of this beautiful fabric that was given to me. So. Um, sometime, probably when I come back from the UK, so not until uh, November, um, you'll see some dresses, and they won't be for me because I only wear white dresses, okay? Um, but, uh, but I will be making some beautiful Marimekko dresses as well. And then I'm also getting excited. Um, I want to make, uh, I, there's a, a shirt pattern that I want to make for myself, and I've been looking at these beautiful flannels online. Um, and since we're coming up into cold months, I'm gonna buy some flannels and I'm gonna make um, the Fairfield uh, pattern from um, Thread Theory Designs. So that's coming up probably in a couple months, but... <coughs> mm, excuse me. I had a frog in my throat today. Too much talking. So, that's it for my finished object and for my works in progress. Um, but that's not it for this episode of the podcast because I've got uh, a number of other things that I want to talk to you about. And the first is I've gotten several questions from folks about cables and cable knitting. As I said, I'm a cable freak. I love cables. Um, if something has cables on it, I'm 20 times more likely to make it. I probably, three out of four or four out of five of everything I knit is, has cables in it. So um, I really love cables. And I want to talk to you about them. Give a little session on cable knitting. Um, so excuse my looking down because I have my notes here to remind me. There's a lot to talk about with cables. Um, the first is why I love cables so much. And, you know, the thing is on one level, with taste, you can't explain it. You just like the things you like. The heart wants what it wants, you know? Um, and so I just like them. I think they're beautiful. Um, they're sculptural, they're elegant, they're timeless. Um, in the same way that lace is, actually, you know, and I, and I don't particularly care for lace. I mean, I can look at it and, and see that it's beautiful, but I don't feel drawn to it. Um, and I think that's because cables can be really masculine. Um, I mean, they can, they work for men in a way that lace really generally does not. Um, but I think there's something more than that, too. I mean, cables, um, take me back to Celtic knots. Um, I've always felt really drawn to Celtic culture. Um, I read the stories of, 
uh, King Arthur and his knights as a kid, which I know is not Celtic, but um, sort of in that mythical, you know, landscape there. Um, I love going to the UK. I'm so excited to go to Ireland. Um, my family history is Welsh and Irish. Um, <clears throat> my monastic name, Aidan, is Irish. That was a, a, pur a purposeful choice for me to um, connect with my Celtic heritage and with Celtic spirituality. So um, cables sort of are tied in with that in a way. Um, I mean, Aaron knitting is actually not that old. It's only maybe 150 years old at this point, but, um, but it's in the kind of, you know, mythical kind of landscape um, of, of the Celtic world. Um, the other thing about, um, and this is true of Celtic knots, which are all throughout, you know, um, Celtic crosses and, and other Celtic imagery, um, there's this kind of tension between order and chaos in them. So, you know, with cable knitting, especially more elaborate cable knitting, it seems almost as if the pattern could just explode into chaos. Um, and yet it's it's very ordered and regular and there are these beautiful patterns in it and you can follow the lines and and sort of like life nothing goes in a straight line but it all kind of winds its way um, in, a, in a discernible pattern um, life doesn't always wind its way in a discernible pattern but it certainly doesn't go in straight lines um, so that's kind of that's a bit about why I love cables. Um, and I just find that they're really special too. You know, you make something cabled and you give it as a gift and it shows that you really have worked very hard on something. And, um, and it's a way of really conveying how much you care for somebody when you give them a, a piece that it took you some skill and some effort and some time to make. And that's true of any knitting, of course. But the more complex a knitting project is, the more that may be true. Um, so I learned to cable. I was always drawn to cables, but I learned to cable by jumping in and trying it. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I think I talked a couple episodes ago about the first cable project I made, which was the Pearl Soho Traveling Cable Hand Warmers. And I made it just because it was beautiful. Um, or I wanted to make it just because it was beautiful. But I had no idea how difficult it was going to be. And like any new skill, I had to learn how to do it. Now I could do that project. In fact, I'm thinking about making another set of those hand warmers. Um, and it would be probably very easy. Um, but the first time I did it, it was not very easy. So I'm just really stubborn. And so I got into the project and it was really hard and I just kept going with it. Um, and what that meant was that I learned a lot. I learned a lot about cabling. Um, and then I just kept making cabled things and each project has taught me something else about cable knitting. Um, so that's kind of how I learned. Um, I read a lot of books about cable knitting. I've read blogs about it. I um, read through the patterns to pick up new techniques, all that kind of thing. I read through Ravelry project notes. Um, and lo and behold, now I'm a really good cable knitter. So there's no magic in it. Just the more you do something, the better you get at it, the more comfortable you get with it. Um, and I wanted to cable because I think it's beautiful. So I put in the time and I've learned how to do it. Um, so I wanted to give you um, just a little overview of cables. Um, and this is going to be very basic. So if, you're, if you have some experience cable knitting, this is all stuff you already know. Um, but for those who don't have a lot of experience with it, this may be some new information or new way of thinking about it. Um, 
they're basically, basically, I'm oversimplifying here, but there are basically two kinds of cable knitting. There are braids and there are traveling cables. So a braid is, just to give you an example, a braid is this um, right here, if you can see that in the ribbing there. A braid is just a cable that goes up and down vertically. Um, traveling cables are in the same garment right here, a line of knitting that travels left or right, kind of diagonally in your knitting. And then obviously you can combine the two, as this pattern does right here, where you have braids that travel. So those are the basic kinds of cable knitting. Um, cabling, as I should have even just started by saying this, cabling is only switching the um, orientation of your stitches or the, the kind of direction of your stitches. So you have a pattern that goes knit, knit, purl, purl. If you switch those stitches around so that the purls come before the knits, that's cabling. Um, so it's basically, I saw someone on on uh, Instagram just called cabling fancy ribbing. That's basically true. It's made up of knit and purl stitches that generally, not always, but generally stay together. So this pattern works on a 3-2 rib, three knit stitches to two purl stitches, the Heston pullover. Um, so I'm always keeping three knit stitches together and I'm switching them around with two purl stitches, or I'm switching three knit stitches with three knit stitches. Um, so there really is a very regular ordered kind of nature to cables, even though they make these elaborate um, flowing kind of patterns. Um, my... I dropped my notes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so obviously the more complex the pattern is, the more com different combinations there are um, of these kind of cables. Um, so that's just a very basic overview of what cable knitting is. Um, I will say that um, I want to give you a few tips that I have found really helpful in my own cable knitting. Um, the first one, the very, maybe the most important tip, particularly if you're brand new to cable knitting, is to choose a pattern that is very clear and that has very thorough instructions on it. Um, so I highly recommend, there are three pattern writers that I highly recommend, particularly if you're new to cabling. Um, one of them is Brooklyn Tweed. Um, Brooklyn Tweed has extremely thorough directions in their patterns. They provide you with a chart. They often provide you with a written instruction um, of the, for the chart as well. They provide you with detailed instructions on what every single stitch is in that chart. Um, and they provide you with a kind of glossary um, of techniques at the end. So, you know, they will show you, I mean, even basic things like they're not gonna say do a two by two ribbing, they will explain what a two by two ribbing is, you know? Um, so people joke sometimes about how you will get a 20 page pattern from them for a one by one rib beanie, which is the easiest thing in the world to make. Um, but the reason for that is they have some special techniques, but they also are very, very thorough in explaining how to make the pattern. And that is really important if you're not sure of what you're doing, um, because then you can just look it up right there in the pattern and you don't have to go to YouTube and you don't have to go read through people's project notes. And um, I can say I have made I want to say I've probably made 30 different patterns from Brooklyn Tweed, um, probably 29 of them cable patterns, 
and I have not yet found a pattern from them where I came to a step and I could not figure out from their instructions what to do. That has not yet happened. Um, so I really highly recommend their patterns, probably for everything, but certainly for cable knitting. Um, another wonderful place to start, as I've said in the previous episodes, is Tin Can Knits. Um, they also have really thorough pattern instructions, um, but they have a big emphasis in their work on teaching, which I think Brooklyn Tweed does too. Um, but really in giving tutorials and, um, and, and helping people learn and build up their skill set. So, um, like for instance, the Jones cardigan that I made um, and, and I talked about in the previous two episodes, um, there's the pattern, which is very clear, but then there's also on their website, they have tutorials for the Jones cardigan. Um, so you can go on their website and you can read about picking up stitches for a button band, which I know is not cabling, but you know, um, that kind of thing, or, or tips from them on how to cable or explanations of parts of their patterns. Um, so they're also a, a really good resource. And then the third is Pearl Soho. Um, they have a lot of free patterns on their website. They do have some paid patterns, but they have a number of free cabled patterns um, that are beautiful, that are relatively simple, actually. Um, so they're maybe a very good place to start if you're brand new to cabling. Um, and, um, and they also have really thorough instructions. Um, the patterns are pretty clear themselves, um, but then also if you go to, uh, most of their patterns are, are on their website, um, and there's a comment section and people have left comments saying, I'm not sure about this part. I'm not sure about that part. And they respond and they answer the query. Um, so they explain how to, um, how to do that. So those are three great places to start right there. Brooklyn Tweed, Tin Can Knits, Pearl Soho. And a clear pattern that is thorough is a really important component of beginning to do cables in your knitting. Um, another uh, really uh, something that I have found very important, um, and Alice Starmore talks about this in her book on Erin Knitting, um, is that it's really important to learn how to read your knitting. Now, of course, most cable patterns are charted, so you've got to learn how to read a chart in order to do most cable knitting. Um, but um, but it's important to learn how to read the knitting itself so that the pattern kind of gets into your hands and you kind of know without having to look at the chart what's coming up next. Um, now I will say for me that has come largely through experience. The more I knit, the more I learn. And so um, if I were working on the pullover I'm working on now, Two years ago, I would have to sit there with the chart in front of me the entire time. Um, by this point in my knitting of that pattern, I pretty much have the chart memorized. Not because I, I can see all the rows in my head, but because I know the basic way the pattern works. Um, and like I said, cabling is generally pretty regular. So I know that every right side row, I'm switching three knit stitches with two purl stitches until they meet and then I'm cabling them together, um, cabling the knit stitches together. Um, that's something you just learn, you know, your intuition picks that up. But, um, but that comes with practice, but also with paying attention to your knitting. So for instance, nowhere have I read that in cable knitting, you never cross a purl stitch in front of a knit stitch. You always cross it behind a knit stitch. No one has ever explained that to me in writing or in conversation, but I know from having made many cable patterns, I have never yet encountered a pattern that had me cross a purl stitch in front of a knit stitch. It just doesn't work that way. The knit stitches are always in front in cable knitting. 
that's something I just picked up because I was paying attention to the work in front of me. So pay attention to your knitting. Let it speak to you. Let it be the teacher. Um, so that's another, um, another tip from me to you for cables. Um, this may be obvious, but start small. Don't start with a huge cable project. Start with a hat. A hat is a perfect way to start cabling. Um, and say you've only done braids, then find a hat that has traveling cables and try those, you know? Or say you've only done a very simple cable pattern and you want to do something complex, find a hat that has a complex pattern and try that out first before you get invested in a big cable project. So that's another, just another tip there. And then another thing is that I have found it essential to learn how to cable without a cable needle. Um, I am not going to do a tutorial for you right now about that. I highly recommend Isolde Teague's tutorial. That's how I learned. And I'll include the link on my blog in the show notes. Um, but um, cabling without a needle, because you're just rearranging stitches. So unless it's a really long string that you're rearranging, um, you can very easily do that without a cable needle. And the reason for learning to do that is that it just makes things go faster, you know? To have to use the needle um, slows down the knitting process. So I find my cabling goes pretty quickly because I almost never have to use a needle. Now on cable needle. Now on the, the Heston pullover, I do have to use a cable needle because there's a particularly complex cross that's a big part of the project. So I am using a needle for that part of it. Um, but cabling without a needle has seriously, seriously improved my love of cable needling, of cable knitting, I should say, and, um, and also the speed at which I can knit cables. So I would recommend learning that. Um, just a couple of, of uh, little personal things um, about cable cable knitting in terms of yarn and needles. Um, so the needles, I really recommend using metal needles that have sharp tips on them. Um, I just personally don't like knitting with wooden needles. Um, I don't find it an enjoyable experience, um, but also because the majority of the knitting that I do is cable knitting. I need sharp tips, and most wooden needles have pretty blunt tips on them, um, which is great for stockinette, but for cabling, it's not so great because you're having to rearrange stitches, and sometimes the knitting gets tight, and you need to be able to get a fine, kind of precise um, entrance into a stitch. So I use the Chowgu lace tips. That's the only needle I use for anything um, are the chow goos. Um, I should have just invested in an interchangeable set when I started knitting, but I didn't. So at this point I spent twice as much as I would have on an interchangeable set, um, but I have basically a full set of the needles at this point. Um, so, um, but sharp needles and metal I find work better for cabling. Um, the other thing is for yarn, now I realize there are varying opinions on this, so I'm giving you my philosophy on it, but I would say for cabling, your yarn needs to be solid or tonal, no stripes, no variegation. Um, and the reason for that is that you want, you're putting all this work into making these beautiful cables. You want them to show up. And stripes and variegation, they really, really interfere with that. Um, I have not yet seen a cabled project done in stripes or variegated yarn that I liked. Now, that's my opinion. A lot of people do knit cables with stripes and variegated yarn, but I just don't think it looks very good. 
Um, I think it's you're getting two competing messages there. Um, so, I mean, and the other part of it is that um, when I'm knitting something cabled, I'm looking at it as an heirloom. You know, I'm putting in six weeks of my knitting time, of my creative time, into making somebody a sweater or making myself a sweater that's cabled. And I want the person I'm giving that to, if it's me or somebody else, I want that person to be able to wear and enjoy and love that sweater for the rest of their life. Um, and maybe even for that to get passed down. Um, and so I also really gravitate toward colors um, that are going to endure. And, and I do that with all of my knitting, really, except for maybe socks um, or hats. Like small, quick projects, I'll use a kind of faddish yarn, like speckles or something like that, you know, um, which are very of the moment and really fun right now, but 20 years from now, are we gonna want to wear that same thing? I, I doubt it. Um, but I wanna wear this cabled sweater I'm making 20 years from now, so I wanna make it in a color that is going to endure for that time, you know? Um, so that's that's another, another thing I think about with yarn. Um, now, something else to be aware of with yarn and cabling, um, I have found that, and I've used both, but I really prefer woolen spun yarn for large cabled projects. Um, worsted spun yarn will show off your cables uh, really well. Very tightly plied worsted spun yarn. Um, it just makes the stitches really pop. They are sculptural. Um, but especially for sweaters, worsted spun yarn can be very heavy. And in a cabled project, which uses a lot of yarn, more yarn than stockinette, um, I really prefer woolen spun because it's much lighter. So um, my woolen spun sweaters have, they're very warm, but they're really lightweight. You don't feel like you have this heavy sweater on you. Um, and the worsted spun sweaters I've made, that's the, the opposite is true. I mean, I feel warm, but I'm also wearing a heavy sweater. Um, so for other things, I would choose a worsted spun, you know, for smaller things like mittens or hats or, um, or socks or, or what have you, scarves even, um, though those can get pretty heavy too. So, um, and, and woolen spun yarns really show off cables very nicely. Um, Brooklyn Tweed's worsted weight yarn um, and actually their fingering weight yarn are both woolen spun. Um, and so is um, Briggs and Little Regal, which I'm making my second cabled sweater with right now, woolen spun. So that is my spiel on cables. And I see we are at 48 minutes. So I guess we're gonna go to an hour because I have more, more to talk to you about. I can't believe it. Uh, I had two, two? I have three other things to talk to you about. Wow, this is gonna be a long episode. Oh well, that's the way it goes. Um, just to answer some questions that I have gotten and comments that I've gotten um, on previous episodes. So, and I apologize, I didn't write down the names of the people who asked these questions, so I apologize for that. Um, Someone on the last episode made a comment about my use of the word maker. I assume as in the title of the podcast, A Maker's Pilgrimage. And um, she said that, she said that maybe it was a generational thing, but that she found the term maker to be incredibly pretentious. Um, and and that really gave me pause, you know. I mean, of course, at first I was like, oh God, am I pretentious? Um, but I know I can be pretentious. So yes, sometimes, yeah. Um, but when I stopped and thought about that comment, it really helped me to clarify some of my own thinking and why I have purposefully chosen the word maker. 
So to answer the basic question that she was asking, is it a generational thing or is it pretentious? The answer is yes, it is a generational thing and it is pretentious. Um, or rather, it has elements of both in it. Um, so I can't speak to everybody who uses the word maker, but I can speak to my reasons for choosing that word. And they're, they're multi-fold uh, here. Um, one is just for ease sake, because although I am primarily a knitter in terms of my crafting, um, I'm also a sewist, and I also garden, and I also keep bees, and I also write. Um, and so to me, the word maker is more inclusive than the word knitter. Um, or the word crafter, even. Um, it encompasses all of my creative outlets. Um, and it also says that the basis of each of those things is the same. You know, they're all about helping me to, not just to create an object, um, but to kind of explore who I am and what I think about the world and what my assumptions are, and what my tastes are, um, and to connect with other people around all that through making something. So that's one part of it for me. It's just more, more inclusive. Um, but the other part of it, and this is where it can get pretentious, it can, um, and it's also a generational thing, um, is that by choosing the word maker, I am consciously placing myself within a certain movement, a philosophical, spiritual movement that is going on in our culture today, um, really around the world, um, I would say. I mean, I don't know everywhere, but certainly in the U.S. today, um, which is a reaction um, or a response to the kind of... Um, hyper emphasis on technology and digital technology, um, industrial production, um, and kind of the capitalist kind of mindset that um, kind of bears down on that and from which a lot of that springs up as well. Um, which is to say that there, even though we can make things industrially, that um, there is something that's lost when we're not making things with our hands, when we're not making actual stuff. Um, and if I could give an example of that, that has nothing to do with crafting, but I remember listening to an episode of This American Life several years ago after the financial crash and um, in 2008 in the, here in the US, and um, they were, explaining like literally what happened when um, the um, oh gosh why is my mind blanking when the sort of treasury system flooded the the banks with cash gave them an influx of cash to keep them afloat um, and what literally happened was somebody sat down at a computer and typed in a number and hit enter and then the accounts at the banks suddenly had more money in them. Now, was there actually more money? I don't know. It depends on what money is, you know, but I think um, there is, there can be such a divorce these days from the material world um, that the, the making movement is a way of saying, no, I'm, I'm in a body and there's a value in creating something with my own hands that is um, beyond the money that it costs to make that. Now, I don't know if that actually makes sense. To, I mean, a lot of people may not be thinking in that way, so, but that's, that makes sense to me intuitively um, to say that the digital world is not necessarily the most real and that in being so engrossed in the digital world, 
um, which has given us a lot of gifts. I mean, I'm sitting here talking to an iPad and you're going to be listening to it, and that's all thanks to the digital world. So um, I'm not saying that it's, it's a bad thing all the way around, but that there are some drawbacks from it and that we lose something by not being engaged in the creation of material objects. Um, so that is a part of the making movement and I'm aligning myself with that movement um, by using the word maker. Um, and then the whole title, A Maker's Pilgrimage, um, is coming from that place and also saying that um, through my engagement with making material objects, I'm on a pilgrimage to discover more about who I am, um, to discover more about myself, more about other people, more about the creative, uh, created world in which we live, um, and, um, and, and more about God as well. So that is, is a part of that pilgrimage um, aspect. That's, a, that's the short of it, well, the long short of it, but I'm sure there's more to say. Um, and then somebody also asked um, why I had become a monk and um, how I became a monk to tell a little bit about that story. Um, so I'm going to need a little more tea for this. So it's hard, that's a hard question to answer because becoming a monk is not like having a job, you know? You might have a job because you enjoy doing that kind of work. Um, that's certainly an element of why I'm a monk, but it's not the whole of it, and being a monk cannot be condensed down into that. Um, so for me, it's really been a process of um, opening myself up um, of falling in love, of naming the deepest desire of my heart, which I would call the desire for wholeness in God, um, and, and in kind of following where that desire has led me. Um, and the monastery is the place that I have found that's been most conducive to my entering into that wholeness um, and to discovering that wholeness. Um, and I, I remember when I would come here as a guest, um, there's this, we have this kind of rolling hill down to a line of trees that's in front of the river. Um, and I was here for two weeks where I was the only guest and I was, would sit on that hillside and just look down at down the hill at this big meadow and uh, the breeze was blowing and the grass was swaying and the river was moving in the distance um, and there was just this sense of spaciousness here and that was something I had always wanted um, I had always felt like there was not enough space for me and not enough time for me. And when I was here at the monastery, I didn't feel that. I felt that there was enough space for me. I felt that I didn't have to have all the answers. I didn't have to know who I was. I didn't have to be the smartest person around. I didn't have to be the best at anything. I could be me and I could discover me. Um, and that has turned out to be true here. Now, it's not a bed of roses. Um, the hard work of being a monk is that you live in community with a bunch of other human beings and they invite me to be more human myself and they invite me to have more patience with other human beings. Um, just like in a marriage, really. I mean, a successful marriage is one where the two people who are married become more fully who they are. And a lot of that happens through the hard stuff. Um, you know, when you get married, you may not 
think, you know, oh God, this person's breath smells horrible in the morning, you know, but then the kind of honeymoon period wears off and you realize you're in a relationship with another person who is not everything you want them to be. Um, well, that certainly happens in the monastery as well. And that's when the hard work begins. Um, and that's when I'm able to soften because I have made the commitment to do that. Um, so I find it to be a really deeply meaningful way of life for me. Um, and, you know, and, and I do find that there is space for me to enter into wholeness. That's really the heart of it, to enter into wholeness in God. Um, and, and for me, that is what the experience of God is, is entering into this incredible spaciousness that just has room for everything, for all of me and all of everybody else, without me having to stop with the neurosis right now, you know, but just being able to be myself. Um, and, and the other part of it too is that I learn how to love here. And not just how to love other people, but how to love myself. And what's even harder is I'm learning how to be loved. I'm learning how to accept love. Um, and that can be very, very hard and painful. Um, but it's a big part of learning to be human, um, is really learning how to love others and to be loved as well. So in a nutshell, that's why I'm a monk. Now, the last, well, it's not exactly the last, but one uh, quick other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, I've also gotten some questions about this trip that I am taking to the UK. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, one of the other brothers and I are leading a pal pilgrimage uh, trip for two weeks. And so we're going to be traveling all over Wales, Northern England, and Scotland. Excuse me. Um, so we're going to fly into Manchester. We're going to drive to Shrewsbury. We're going to go from there to Murfield, where there's a Benedictine community, just for lunch. Then we'll go to York. From York, we'll go to Lindisfarne, which I'm excited about because that is where St. Aidan, my namesake, uh, founded his monastic community. Then from Lindisfarne, we'll go to Oban. From Oban, we'll go to Iona, which is where Columba um, founded his monastery. And actually, that's where Aidan came from, to go to Lindisfarne. Um, and then from... Um, Oban, I mean, sorry, from Iona, we'll go to Loch Lomond, uh, from Loch Lomond down to Edinburgh, and then from Edinburgh, the whole trip will fly back to the States, except for me. Um, I'm staying behind for a week for uh, my own retreat in Ireland, so I'll fly from Edinburgh to Dublin, and then take a bus from Dublin south to Glendalough. Um, and the, I can't remember if it's the Sisters of Mercy or the Sisters of Charity, but one of them runs some hermitages down in Glendalock, and my spiritual director recommended it to me. Um, I looked at the photos and I was sold. Um, it looks so beautiful. Um, so I will have my own hermitage there for a week in quiet, um, there's a nature park nearby that has a glacial lake in it. Um, the ruins of a uh, very early Christian monastery, St. Kevin's Monastery, are nearby. Um, and I realized I can get, um, if I want to take a day trip, I can get to um, um, St. Bridget's site as well, which I think is only about an hour away from there by bus. Um, and then at the end of my retreat there, I will fly to London just for a day and a half because one of my best friends from college lives in London um, and I love London. It's my favorite city that I have ever been to. So um, I just couldn't be in that area and not go by London. Um, 
So that's my trip, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be work because we have 32 people going on the trip, and I'm one of the leaders. Um, but um, but it's going to be a really really good trip. Um, and so I will podcast again probably right before I leave, and then it'll be a month or so until I podcast because I'm going to be out of the country. But I'll probably do a long podcast then when I get back um, from that trip as well. Um, and I'll take lots of pictures and try to take some videos um, of, of where I am. And I'm sure I will buy yarn because how can you not when you're in the British Isles and Ireland? Um, and, you know, all these fun yarn shops around there. Um, and actually, if you have recommendations for me about a yarn shop in any of those places, please let me know. Um, I will tell you what I have on my list already. I have um, Ginger Twist Studios in Edinburgh. I have This Is Knit in Dublin. Um, and there's another one that Kate of the Hawthorne Crad Cottage Craft podcast recommended. I have it written down, but I don't remember, in Dublin. And then, uh, of course, Loop London um, as well. So any knitting shops or uh, fabric shops in those locations, let me know because uh, I might be able to stop by on a break um, from that. And we're probably going to run pilgrimages again, so um, I'll let you know if I'm going to be leading any because it may be something you'd be interested in joining me for. Um, and you're also always welcome on retreat here at our monastery. Um, we have a retreat during Rhinebeck every year, um, prayerful stitches, and we take a, a day trip over to the Sheep and Wool Festival, um, which I usually lead, help lead, but I'm not gonna be there this year because I'll be in the UK. Um, but then we also have a lot of retreat offerings, so check out our website if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, and then last, but by no means least, I did do a drawing again this week from the subscriber list. So this week I decided I would give, send to one of you, uh, a bottle of Our Holy Cross honey. Um, and so what I did, uh, as I mentioned in the last episode, was I took the subscriber list, the visible subscriber list, and I did a random number generation from that. And number, lucky number 13 won, and that is Sadia Wiltshire, who I have just met on Instagram, actually, um, and does really incredible um, Celtic knots. She's a, a really gifted artist. I think she's also a retreat leader. Um, so I cannot remember her Instagram handle off the top of my head, but I will put that in the show notes too, so you can check out her work. Um, but Sadia, I am excited to send you this bottle of honey. So if you'll send me a message on Instagram, um, I will, uh, with your mailing address, I'll be happy to get this in the mail to you this week. Um, again, a reminder, I'm going to try to do these drawings every episode. Um, so the way to be included in that drawing is to be a subscriber to the podcast. But you do have to be a visible subscriber. Um, and the reason for that is because I can't see people whose subscriptions are private. So, for instance, I have 250 subscribers at the moment but only 114 names appear in my subscriber list. So if you want to be included, make sure you hit subscribe and make sure also that in your YouTube settings, you mark your subscriptions as public rather than private. And then your name will be there and um, you'll be included in any drawings that I do. So that is it for this episode. We're at an hour and eight minutes. I cannot believe it, my goodness. Um, next time we'll probably be back to a half an hour or 45 minutes, but we'll see. It depends on how many questions I get. Um, I do love the comments. I love the questions. So please feel free to reach out in the YouTube comments on Ravelry, on Instagram. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to begin a conversation with you. Um, 
I'd love to see what cabling projects you're up to, so message me or tag me in them, and I will take a look at what you're up to. Um, if you liked this episode, please hit the thumbs up, and please subscribe um, so that you'll know the next time I post a video. Um, again, thank you for watching, um, and I look forward to speaking with you next time. Happy knitting! Flowers. I know. <laughs> and throw up. <laughs> <laughs> the little bodies it are amazing. It tastes good anyway.